Hello, I'm Wakar Rizvi, and this is Scope. In the first segment of today's show, we're going to discuss uh, UK-EU trade talks, which are set to begin soon, and all of this, of course, happening post-Brexit at this time. Uh, the UK is playing hardball, as seemingly is the EU, and the question right now stands, who needs the other side more? Who will bow more? Who goes into these negotiations in a stronger position? The argument in some quarters is that the UK is in a stronger position. Um, if we consider, for example, how much it uh, contributed to the EU budget and otherwise, also the EU is saying that it cannot give uh, the UK a Canada-style free trade agreement because this is a much larger market and threatens its own goods and services as well. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're now joined by Teresa Nabotna, who is Senior Associate Research Fellow at European, which is a Prague-based think tank, and Mary Zbalska Kuro Fellow at Free University Berlin. She's joining us now from Berlin itself. Joining us from Sussex in the UK is Paul Bromley, who is a political analyst and university lecturer. Paul and Teresa, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Paul, let me start with you. Um, obviously, at this point in time, we've had um, Boris Johnson saying that by the end of this year, we will have a deal or not, and that'll be completely fine for the UK. Um, is it that simple, do you think? Well, we've had an entire four weeks, by my calculation, since the UK formally left the EU, uh, when we haven't actually talked about Brexit. And now here we are, right back in the middle of it, where Brexit is starting to dominate all the headlines once again. Uh, the talks begin formally on Monday. That's the first round of talks. That will be four days of talks in Brussels, followed by um, another four rounds of talks, two in London and two in Brussels. So it's no surprising that it, at this very early stage of negotiations, the two sides are on this collision course. They have set out very different points of view. From the UK's point of view, there is this threat that they will walk away if there is no significant progress by June, although there, there is the option for the talks to continue until the autumn. And that very much plays to Boris Johnson's style of negotiations, where he does feel as though it is only by making that threat to walk away at this very early stage that he believes that progress can be made and that the other side will come to the table and give some concessions to the UK's arguments. Hmm. But Teresa, I wonder what your thoughts on the EU position going into these talks on Monday, because we just recently had uh, this EU budget meeting, right, where I believe it was 81 or so billion, which was spoken of as this vacuum almost left because of the UK's departure from the bloc. Um, and that obviously needs to be filled, as well as other expenditures uh, amongst the EU member states as well. Um, do you think that those sorts of realizations mean that the EU may be willing to concede more to the UK in these trade talks? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, you are right that uh, the EU has put forward its own position uh, early this week. Um, that position basically wants from the UK to be aligned with uh, the EU rules and regulations as much as possible. Um, so, uh, so that basically uh, the UK doesn't become sort of an economic tiger on Thames, uh, sort of uh, the, the competition very close home. Um, you mentioned the budget talks. Um, uh, the EU member states are quite aware that uh, the UK has been a, a, a net contributor and therefore there is a hole in the budget which needs to be filled. Uh, but that doesn't have much to do with uh, the way in which uh, the future relationship with the UK will work. So no matter whether there is a deal or no deal, uh, the the amount of money uh, that the UK used to pay into the budget will have to be filled in. So uh, from the budget perspective, uh, yeah. there is not much uh, much of uh, pressure the UK can insert uh, on 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 the EU. Before before I move on, Theresa, I wanted to stick with you. Do you agree with the EU stance that the UK uh, cannot be given a Canada-style agreement? Well, the EU's argument is that uh, Canada is uh, much farther away uh, and uh, therefore the, the geographical, um, the geographical uh, distance uh, makes it difficult to do the same sort of uh, uh, deal. Also, the fact that uh, 
Um, Canada has uh, has had different di different types of uh, trade relationship uh, before with the EU. So in a way, now we are having a country which is as closely aligned as possible, which wants to kind of uh, make the alignment looser. While with Canada, the the, the process was exactly the opposite. Yeah. Um, also, there's of course an issue of uh, the, uh, the the products which uh, have been traded between the two uh, countries uh, or, and the EU. So yeah. um, I wouldn't say that there is no ambitious trade deal possible, but yes, I think the Canada style is a bit uh, too of a different example than uh, the UK can achieve with the EU. Hmm. All right. So Paul, what are, what are your thoughts about the the UK? at this time at least, insisting that it does want something along the lines of what Canada has gotten as far as a free trade deal with the EU. Um, is that realistic? Um, is Johnson asking for too much? I think at this stage, it's very much setting out his stall and in particular the attractions for a conservative party that's now well uh, in government with a big majority is the fact that the Canada-style deal would offer that tariff-free option that the Conservatives as uh, a party of business really favour, as well as removing some of the barriers to trade. What they don't want and what they don't like is any attempt by the European Union to impose restrictions on the movement of goods uh, and services. And that's uh, why part of the negotiating document says that the UK would no longer be bound by EU laws such as the European Court of Justice as well. That is a big sticking point for a Conservative Prime Minister and a Conservative government in the UK. These talks are actually going to be broken down into 11 different subject areas. In fact, there are 11 different negotiating teams taking place and they will all negotiate simultaneously. So there is a lot of work that's going to be taking place over the next few months on all these issues, from things like transport and security through to fishing, which is a very big issue for the United Kingdom government. Uh, Paul, do you think that, that Johnson realizes that, you know, as much as he may, of course, want a very good deal with the U.S. as well, that the EU, as Theresa there correctly said, is closer geographically? So, I mean, he needs to make this work with the EU first to be able to really prove himself, doesn't he? Um, he's actually trying to, have, trying to have it both ways, because at the same time as the ne negotiations start in Brussels, for the EU trade talks post-Brexit and post the transition period. So at the same time, the uh, International Trade Secretary, Liz Truss, is setting out the negotiating position with the US and how future relations will work. So he's both an Atlanticist and a European trying to negotiate the best, uh, as he would see it, for Britain. Um, Europe is certainly the largest export market for the UK. Now that it is effectively outside the club, it is having to try to negotiate ways in which it can get the benefits of being a member of the club without making those financial contributions that Theresa was talking about. So there are a lot of still uh, very sore issues within the negotiations between the UK and the EU following the decision to leave the EU formally. Exactly. And that, that's what I wanted to raise up because uh, politics will no doubt play into all this, won't it? I mean, of course, we can talk about the, the nitty gritty of the trade um, deals within these 11 spheres, as, as Paul there spoke of, uh, including fishing, which, is, which I know is extremely important for the UK and for the EU. Um, but then considering there is a significant amount of bad blood, I would imagine, between these two sides at this point because of Brexit and because of how that process was so long and drawn out, um, do you think that the EU is also looking to make an example almost out of the UK? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I think the political mood uh, is quite important, especially in Brussels. Uh, the previous president of the Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, who we are just showing on the screen, he was quite um, disappointed um, that he had to spend lots of time of his work on Brexit. And uh, I think this this is a, a mood in Brussels in general. We also want to, you know, get it over with, get it done as quickly as possible. Um, so for the talks, the Brexit talks, uh, it was quite remarkable that there was really strong unity among the member states and the Commission and the uh, the negotiator Michel Barnier had really strong hand because he had a united front behind him. 
Uh, I think this is uh, going to be uh, a bit less so in this phase that member states will possibly have some um, uh, individual thinking how to shape uh, the negotiations. But it's true that the EU wants to move on, wants to move on with its internal issues, with the budget di discussion, the new Green Deal and so on. And so the EU is not going to uh, is not going to be willing to spend lots of time uh, on Brexit, especially, you know, to call some kind of uh, special summits and so on. Um, also, there is a issue of uh, the um, the protocol about Northern Ireland, yeah. uh, which has been ca causing some issues, uh, because it seems like that the British uh, government is sort of trying to basically um, avoid it or let's say um, to undermine its implementation and of course if you negotiate something uh, and this is already part of the visceral agreement and then you are trying to sort of uh, uh, you know go around it circumvent what you've agreed it doesn't exactly uh, create a, a good uh, good faith uh, atmosphere for further negotiations um, so yeah. this is uh, this is another thing which is influencing the mood in Brussels, which is I would say in general very skeptical about reaching a, a deal by the end of this year. Okay, just before letting you both go, Paul, a final word um, uh, before I go to break. What do you think, Paul, about um, the the current political mood then between the two sides? As I put to Theresa as well, certainly the EU would want to make an example out of the UK, but as you had al already alluded to as well in your earlier answers. It's also Johnson which wants to make a point here. Um, that makes it very difficult to negotiate, doesn't it? Or do you think both sides will just uh, get down to the work that's needed? Um, it does make it difficult in terms of the background to the negotiations. I'm sure the negotiators will do uh, their very best, just as there was no one who seriously wanted the UK to leave the EU without a deal. That has now been achieved. And there are lots of high stakes. There will be lots of... Uh, talks going on. There will be lots of uh, meetings and press conferences when there's no agreement reached and things look gloomy. There is a habit, I think, and a trend for these things to go uh, right down to the wire. So it wouldn't come as any surprise if a deal is reached, but perhaps later in the day uh, than we thought. Bear in mind, we are at the very start of what is a negotiating process. The one thing that the uh, British do find uh, that they can already chalk up perhaps as a 1-0 victory over Brussels is that the talks will be negotiated primarily in English. And if there are any discussions that have to take place in French, then it is the side that wants the talks to be in French that will have to pay for those translations. A very interesting point to get to our break on. Um, Paul and Teresa, we appreciate your time and, of course, your insight. Viewers, I'll be back right after this break, continuing the discussion on these EU-UK trade talks. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with the Milkar Rizzi. We're continuing the discussion now um, on the EU-UK trade talks, which will begin on Monday. And just in the lead up to it, we're talking about the mood going into those talks, because these are these are vital talks for both sides, really. Uh, let me continue the discussion. We're now joined by two new voices. We're joined by Valeria Alfonso Bruno, who is a senior research fellow at CARR. He's joining us now from Napoli in Italy. And we're also joined by Jonathan Hines, who's a co-founder and presenter at UK Talk Radio and formerly producer and presenter of Talk Solent on That Solent TV. He's joining us out from Bournemouth in the UK. Jonathan and Valerio, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Valerio, let me start with you. Um, tell us, if you can, what the mood is possibly within the European Union about how, uh, how, how much they're willing to compromise, really, on the EU side to be able to get a trade deal with the UK. Um. I think there is not just one perspective uh, within the European Union. There should be, let's say, um, more institutional response. We should be inflexible uh, without uh, reaching any compromise uh, for the Brexit deal. Unfortunately, the problem is that we have, um, of course, different voices, and there are many, many radical right parties, for example, uh, in Italy and in France, and they're willing to compromise. They want a, a soft stance uh, with the Brexit deal. Um, I wrote an article two days ago with uh, John Pfeffer. He's a director from the Institute for Policy Studies in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And we were saying that, that this is the real problem. Uh, in Europe, many, many countries now, uh, they are led by, or will be led in the future by radical right parties. And they're willing to compromise 
the more uh, the more time will pass, the more the leader will take power in um, in our countries, the softer will be the stance. Yeah. In the past, we had this uh, propaganda, this rhetoric about you know trying to have Italy outside the European Union, trying to have Frexit, uh, Spexit, etc., etc. But right now, the only radical party we have, uh, which is willing to have uh, withdrawal from the European Union, is a uh, uh, alternative for Deutschland in uh, in Germany. Yeah. The other one, they just want a soft stance with uh, with Boris Johnson. That's it. Mm. Okay, so Jonathan, is, uh, yeah, the news, you know. Indeed. Uh, so, J Jonathan, what are, what are your thoughts sitting there in the UK? I mean, what is the mood there like going into these talks? Because Johnson has has almost made this impossible vis-a-vis -vis the timeline, right? Where everyone has already said this is going to be really hard to achieve within the time frame that he has set out. But nevertheless, he's being very strong. He's saying, listen, if it doesn't go my way even early on, I'll just walk away. Um, is it that simple, do you think? It does sound oversimplistic, yes, because, I mean, there is so much um, to negotiate and uh, it's very, very intricate. There are so many areas. Uh, it's been 40 years. Um, I personally believe that um, negotiation with the European Union um, is a misnomer. I don't think negotiation really exists. I think it's more uh, a tug of war, more uh, wrangling. Um, I think it's a lot more aggressive than that. I don't think negotiation is even possible um i think it's i think there's an awful lot of um in my view anyway brutal um, manipulation coming from uh, the european union uh, side of the side of it and um seeking as much control uh, as possible um and i know that sounds extreme but that's the way i've viewed it uh, for a long time i view the european union as a dangerous um set up. And so I do feel that we may have to be, yes, very, very strong. And although it doesn't sound very diplomatic, um, we may have to just walk away. I feel that it will have to be something like that, unfortunately. Okay, so let me stick with you then, Jonathan. If, if the UK does decide to walk away and there is no deal uh, come the end of this year, um, what, what I've understood is that the, the country would then automatically revert to WTO rules and then there would be tariffs, um, you know, both ways ready with the EU trade. Um, is that a good scenario? I've always said, always said um, there'll be a, a, difficult, a very difficult, complicated transition period. Um, and people often talk about going to World Trade Organization um, stipulations, and that would be the, the way forward, and we could just resort to that. I know it's not quite as simple and, and, and basic as that, but that is a a realistic viable option. Um, it won't be instant, it won't be a quick instant fix, but it is a, it is a realistic and uh, legally viable uh, option. And um, people have been asking that uh, for a long time, but I feel the European Union, unfortunately, I don't want to say this, but the European Union um, seeks uh, to have as much control as possible over as, mm. uh, over as many people, as many nations as possible. and. Um, okay. It's a, it's a very dark view to take, but that's how I, yeah. how I view it. So we may have to do something drastic and just walk away. Valeria, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you agree with Jonathan? I mean, that is one of the reasons why Brexit happened, right? Where there were a lot of people within the UK still who believe that the EU simply is too controlling. So is that going to hurt the bloc when it comes to even these talks with the UK? Because, you know, they've said that uh, they cannot have a Canada-style agreement, that, that the UK would need to abide by several EU rules when it comes to the open market, etc. Um, and the UK is, you know, resistant to that. Um, I agree with Jonathan. I think there would be no, no deal at all. That right now, the, um, the UK has all the, you know, the, the reasons to be willing not to find any, any compromise. And, and until, uh, I mean, for the June, the next month, but in the long run, I think the scenario for the UK will be rather bad. Uh, if they go to the basic WTO, let's say, default rules, it's gonna, not going to be uh, easy for the UK, so they will pay even more you know, on, uh, on the long run. Uh, that's why I think right now Johnson has to take advantage of the division with the European Union, has to do like, you know, a sort of bluff, playing his cards rather well, and uh, trying not to find any any compromise uh, 
give any concession to the European Union strategy, I think this is going to, to pay. But um, even there is this hypothesis of um, the uh, uh, United Kingdom uh, turning into a sort of uh, a fiscal uh, paradise, I mean, which is possible, sort of uh, Singapore uh, in Europe. But I think on the long run, the, the UK will suffer um, huge economic and financial cons consequences. But right now, Johnson has to, to be, you know, to show to the world, that, to the European Union, you know, that it is strong, that he has the situation mm -hmm. under control, and try to, to take advantage of these many divisions that there are uh, uh, within the European Union. But then, but then the same argument can be made also on the European side, counted Valerio, where, you know, we just recently had these budget talks uh, within the EU bloc members, and they weren't able to come to an agreement in the first meeting, at least, because there's a huge vacuum, right, left by the UK leaving the bloc. Um, and then, obviously, there's talk about the annual payments, 11 billion euros, which um, the UK would give the EU on, on an annual basis um, to, as part, as a member country. Um, I, I wonder... In a sense, the EU also needs this just as badly as the UK, doesn't it? No, no, I think it's rather asymmetrical. I know there is a lot of you know, talks going on about this vacuum budget, but I think it's sort of you know, just uh, symbolical. It's not so, so big. The problem is that even in this case, with a rather small uh, uh, economic cost, uh, European member states and also Germany, France, Italy, they are not able to find agreement. So, I, I mean, uh, practically speaking, the, that's not a big problem, this vacuum for the, the budget. The real problem is that, once again, uh, the European Union uh, is divided. Once again, they cannot have one single voice. But, uh, practically speaking, I think the, the, the real problem will be on the side of the United Kingdom on the long run. Mm. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, what are your thoughts on that? Because, I, I mean, I don't want to go too, too deep into the economics because, you know, that gets confusing sometimes for viewers. But do you think that at some level, as you said as well, that during the transition period, there will be a painful period for the country? But overall, uh, with all of the talk that's happened on both sides, you know, we've had warnings both ways, haven't we, where the UK leaving is a bad thing for the economy, the UK staying and the EU is bad for the economy. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Most people who voted uh, for Brexit were aware that, aware that it was going to be a long and arduous process. But uh, in, in, the lo in the long term, things will be much more um, free, much more, much better for the UK uh, generally. And I think, um, to me, common sense would say we just need um, we need some sort of community. You know, we need friendship, cooperation uh, for European countries to come together um, at certain times to discuss certain things. But we don't need this 24-hour this a day. Well, well, maybe that's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean, this 24-7 huge parliamentary machine in Brussels. I don't understand the point of that at all. I think it's um, just surreal, unbelievable. We just need friendship, cooperation, like groupings of other countries all over the world do. Um, you know, you don't have a, a union like this anywhere else in the world. Um, and I think there'll be this, this kind of domino effect, I think, in the next 12 months. The, the move for Frexit, that's uh, France uh, coming out of the European Union, is going to get stronger and stronger and more powerful. I think more and more French people are uh, starting to feel envious um, or jealous, um, you know, or full of admiration um, for what the UK has done and how we've, um, you know, uh, uh, taken a stand for our... Uh, sovereignty and our, you know, um, national identity uh, and culture. Mm. Um, I, I've spoken to a lot of French people who really want the same for France, but they're not sure when that's going to be possible and, and how it's going to be possible. Mm. Uh, but they would really like that. Okay. Um, uh, Valerie, I'll give you the final word under a minute if you can. Um, do you think that when it comes down to even trade talks or however, that this is a huge test for the EU as a bloc, right, just to see if it can make this work, um, if it can come together, because you've already spoken about the divisions within all these very important EU members as well, such as Germany, France, and others, of course, with the other bloc members also. Will the bloc be able to come together, make this work, uh, and prove almost to itself and the rest of the world that it can, it can still work together? I think there is a, a good news and a, a bad news. The good news, and I'm quite sure of that, it's 
countries like France and Italy, they don't want to withdraw anymore from the European Union. Uh, right now, the, the strategy is to try to change uh, institutional institutions from of the European Union from the from within, from inside, not from the outside. It will be too costly, too complicated. Salvini, Le Pen, right now they don't speak anymore about you know exit, Ital exit or uh, Frexit uh, from the um, from the European Union. The, this is, uh, I would say, a, a, a rather good news. The, the bad news is that once again, no, I'm sure we will not have a united European Union in the in the talks with the, about the Brexit deal, the, the agreement. Once again, there will be division. Uh, there will be one country pushing for something like Germany. Other country they want to protect more uh, agriculture like uh, France. So there will be, unfortunately, not a united uh, voice. Mm. Right now, it should be the, right the opposite because it should be like one voice and non compromise at all with the United Kingdom. Right now, this is well. the, the time to be just one, uh, one voice. Very well. We'll leave there as a final comment. Of course, we appreciate both Valerio and Jonathan for their time and, of course, their insight on this. Uh, viewers, we try to give you, um, you know, all possible opinions on this topic because it's an important one. This affects the EU and the UK quite drastically, doesn't it? If there is no deal, if the UK does. Um, really mean it when it says that by June, if it doesn't feel that things are going well, that it'll just walk away, it'll declare no deal, um, possibly WTO rules will come into effect then, tariffs included, all of the above. Uh, what does that then mean for both sides? Um, uh, does this mean that divisions within the EU will become that much more prominent? Um, what does that mean for the UK economy as well? Because it's not that simple, right? We also have fishing rights and et cetera, which are extremely, extremely important for the UK as well at this point in time and its economy. Uh, so we'll obviously wait and see what happens starting Monday and how those talks go. The timeline is very, very quick and very short, uh, as Johnson himself has put it. And we'll wait and see uh, if he can really make this work. He has made Brexit work so far, seemingly, uh, along his own terms. I'll be back with my next segment after this. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wakar Rizmi. In this segment of today's show, we're going to discuss Turkey. Um, and, of course, we can talk about a lot of specific areas when it comes to that country at this point in time. It is in the news um, because of what's happening in Syria's Idlib uh, and also, of course, Turkey's involvement in that region. But Turkey's also made a decision at this point in time about the Europeans and about the migrant issue also, which is, which is what I want to hone in on for, for this segment today. Uh, keeping, of course, in mind what is happening in Idlib, because that does, of course, have an effect on all of this. With Turkey saying, and President Erdogan spoke uh, just uh, a few hours before this recording begun, about why Turkey has made the decision possibly to open its borders and allow uh, asylum seekers to now enter into Europe. Now, this, as you remember, goes back to a deal that the EU had with Turkey, I believe, back in 2016, um, where essentially the Europeans were to give Turkey money or aid to support it to be able to host very large numbers of Syrian refugees. President Erdogan today mentioning, I believe, the number is 3.7 million. However, uh, he also then went on to say that that money has not actually been received, the money that was promised by the likes of Angela Merkel and others. Um, and so he's saying that they're hosting, Turkey is hosting all these refugees, and more refugees may be coming now to the country or want to come to the country because of the situation in Idlib, and the Turkey simply cannot take more and more without the EU doing its part in the deal as well. Let's discuss that further. We're now joined by Andrea Soyan Karadadi, who is an independent researcher. She's based in Istanbul. And joining us from Ankara is Valeria Gianotta, who is an academician, expert of international relations at Turk Hava Kurumu Universitesi in Ankara. Uh, Valeria and Andrea, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Valeria, let me start with you. Um, on one side, of course, we have the argument that Turkey may be using this issue of migrants to its benefit uh, because of what's happening in Idlib, i.e. to get a reaction from the Europeans. And on the other side, then we have the Turkish um, argument for itself saying we simply cannot continue to host more and more refugees without the Europeans doing their part. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, actually, uh, we should say that Turkey has been handled by itself almost unilaterally the burden of uh, hosting refugees within its borders. 
since the, the crisis in Syria, in Syria erupted in 2011. So, and the deal with the European Union came just after five years, in uh, March 2016. And as uh, you rightly mentioned before, it aimed to just give, to support Turkey with 6 billion euros in three years. Of course, out of these 6 billion euros, not all money, or not the financial support as a has come to, to Turkey yet. And this has created sort of frustration in Ankara and among the policymakers and within the Turkish society as well. Because if we consider the total amount of money that Turkey has spent so far in order to host and accommodate the Syrian refugees that we incorrectly call the refugees because uh, actually uh, Turkey did not sign the Geneva Agreement, the Geneva Convention on Refugees, so they are there are people that they are living under special protection within the Turkish border. It means that to those Syrian Turkey, the Turkish government grants the, the right of education and the public assistance so they can enjoy any right within the hospital and within the public institutions here in Turkey. And if we consider the amount of financial effort that Turkey has put on the table since 2011, it exceeded $40 billion so far. So if we compare the, the Turkish effort is it has been a giant effort in containing the crisis and to the extent that Turkey has been considered one of the most important donors worldwide. So this okay. has created sort of yeah. a frustration in Ankara as well. And yeah. the triggering event, as, as uh, you mentioned before, well, came from the situation in Syria and in Libya. Nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, around one million more refugees are pushing towards the Turkish border from uh, the, Syri the Syrian side. In, uh, mm -hmm. uh, considering that Turkey has experienced a sort of a, economic, uh, a huge economic problem. I mean, nowadays, the Turkish lira has lost uh, his power comparing to the international market. Yeah. And consider that there is a huge, I mean, increasing rate of unemployment. And the civil society, the Turkish mm. civil society, is a bit tiring. They cannot digest any longer the presence of these Syrians and the nationalist feeling. Okay, so if, if, if I may, I, I just wanted to come in and, and get to and Andrea with, with some of those points as well. Andrea, I wanted to get your thoughts on, of course, what Valerdier has said. But I wanted to add this on, too, because, you know, those who would criticize Turkey, Andrea, would say, why then is Turkey involved to begin with in Syria if it is, um, if it realizes that, of course, all of these uh, asylum seekers would come to its border and seek refuge within its border? I mean, uh, that, the argument, of course, from the pro-Syrian side, I'm saying, would be that if it's Turkish involvement, which has led to all of this, how, how do you respond to that? Um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for um, this question especially. Please allow me to begin by expressing my condolences um, to the Turkish population, to the Turkish nation and especially to the families of the soldiers that were mart martyred in Idlib. Um, uh, Definitely, there have been a lot of uh, critis critics towards Turkey as well. But when it comes to the situation in Syria, Turkish is defending its own borders. And it has the right to do so. And of course, people who live in that region of Turkey, um, around the 900 kilometers of border with Syria, would definitely agree with what I'm saying now. It's a way of defending their own national uh, borders, their sovereignty at the same time. Um, what happened in Idlib is unfortunate, and the situation regarding the refugees, it's worsening as we speak. Um, the, situ the, the situation, the, um, the conflict escalating in Idlib resulted in more uh, refugees coming towards Turkey, and we have now numbers around 900,000 and 1 million refugees that are expected to be coming to Turkey again in the following days. Mm. Um, then uh, Valeria has been mentioning very well the effort uh, provided by Turkey when it comes to the refugees that came in the past years. And I would like also to mention the fact that the people that we're speaking about are not just Syrian refugees. If you look at the ones that are now trying to get into um, the borders of uh, Greece or Bulgaria. Um, they are not just re the Syrian refugees, there are people from very various countries, such as Afghanistan as well. 
And then um, if we mirror a little bit the situation um, and we go back a few years ago and when these refugees came to Turkey, we should remember the fact that Turkey by that time, by that time had yeah. an open door policy. So the way those people were accepted was with an open door without even checking um, their documents, their IDs. Mm. Security wise, that's not a good thing. But humanitarian wise, that's a very important thing that Turkey did. And it mm. kind of showed the fact that it pressures the human value. Now, mm. the way those um, refugees are treated, you can see it on TV. I've been watching it uh, very sadly uh, in the past two days. They are welcomed with um, gas bombs. Mm. Uh, and they are trying to be returned to Turkey uh, without being let into the, the borders of Greece or Bulgaria. Um, and those, okay. those yeah. people are actually risking their lives right now. Yeah. Oh, Valeria, then, then what do you think is that Turkey wants Europe to do at this time? Right, Because um, for Turkey at this point in time to, to say, listen, because of what's happening in Idlib, uh, we're going to open our borders to an extent and allow for some of these asylum seekers to enter into Europe, um, because uh, yeah, on the Turkish side, the argument is that Europe hasn't fulfilled its end of the bargain. But it's also a question of timing, right? Um, is this, as critics would say, almost just Turkey blackmailing Europe? I mean, why choose now to make this decision about the borders? I mean, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has uh, called several times Europe to pay attention to the Syrian uh, issues, uh, to the Syrian issues, and to the position of Turkey in uh, in the region. Definitely, this is a way, and this is the right uh, the, the right moment, according to Ankara. Since I mean, they experience uh, they experience a huge crisis. I mean, as it was mentioned before, I mean the 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 murder of 33 soldiers, and Turkey nowadays feels totally alone in the regional context and in facing Assad regime force in Idlib. Actually, Turkey and Russia was one of the, the architects of this such agreement that was aimed at uh, creating an escalation de zone and demilitarized zone in Idlib in order to create a sort of ceasefire and uh, aim at providing uh, uh, assistance to the Syrian civilians in, uh, in Idlib. All of these, unfortunately, as we all say, is uh, it was compromised by the, 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 the terrorist attack by the Assad regime backed by the Russian forces recently two days ago. So definitely Turkey it feels alone in Syria and they say we are there in order to protect the, the civilians because the Syrian people called us but we are there for protecting ourselves as well because if we leave it leave, if we leave Syria, the next target of Assad will be Turkey. And definitely uh, Erdogan and the, the Turkish government want to show to the, to the international public opinion that the situation it cannot be handled anymore in this way. So it wants to attract the sort of uh, support and a sort of attention to this case. Okay, so so Andrea, if, if we may just talk about Idlib for a moment, right? Because if we're looking at the situation in Idlib, uh, as you know, there are two arguments to that situation, right? Where on the one side, there's the Turkish view on that, as well as, you know, a, a lot of the international community's view about the humanitarian situation in Idlib, et cetera, the facts on the ground as they are. And on the other side, then we have the Syrian point of view on this, as well as the Russian point of view, that Idlib is, at the end of the day, Syrian territory and comes within Syrian borders. So Syria has every right to want to, quote unquote, liberate it or recover, um, you know, control over that area. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I believe that what Turkey has been trying to do for a long while now it's to create a buffer zone, a safe zone. And the, the first reason, like the first reasoning for aiming at this buffer zone is not necessarily just the, uh, the aim of protecting inter borders. It's also the humanitarian side of the issue. The fact that we have all those people that have been displaced, they, they need a safe, a safe zone. Unfortunately, when it comes to the de different perspective, different perspectives and sides in the in the case of Idlib, um, what is for sure right is the fact that nine, none of the two um, most important sides in the whole in the story, which is Russia and the U.S., um, none of them have actually kept their promise when it comes to Idlib and when it comes to Syria, the conflict in Syria, uh, generally speaking. So. 
the reason why Turkey is uh, pushed towards being there and providing more and more military support there is because the other sides involved in the story have not actually fully kept their promises um, that they and their agreements, their sides in the agreements that have been signed so far. So what needs to be done right now is definitely to get to um, a farther, very fast agreement. Um, the conflict escalation has to stop. Okay. And the, the the regime especially has to understand that it's not just Turkey that it, it that it actually hits to. It's also also their own people that they're um, they're killing right now. All right, we'll leave there as a final word, but we appreciate both Andrea and Valeria for their time and, of course, for sharing their insight with us. Um, as I put to both of our guests, there, there are many points of view when it comes to the issue of Idlib uh, and Syria as a whole, really, ever since the crisis there begun. Um, but on the Turkish side, there are concerns, uh, Turkey says, about its own national security and what was happening on its border uh, within Syria, of course, but how that impacts its own uh, national security, as well as its own uh, just society as a whole, really, with all of these refugees coming across the border ever since the crisis has begun in Syria. And then what Europe and how Europe has acted throughout this process, even after coming to that agreement with Turkey, uh, President Erdogan saying that the Europeans have not lived up to their promises of providing the kind of aid that they had been promised for Turkey to then stem the flow of those refugees into, into Europe. Um, so at this point in time, again, a complex web, really, of differing interests. The Syrian side says we have the right to take over control over all of our territory. Uh, but then there are genuine humanitarian concerns as well throughout that process. Uh, can Russia and uh, Turkey come to an agreement over this issue, or will this create a divide between them? Then what does that mean for the Astana process, et cetera, et cetera? A lot of questions still remain in the air. We'll keep a close eye on that, of course, here in Scope. I'll leave it there for now, though. I've been Wakar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.